Um, so yeah, so so access the access model means a lot of things to many different people. I've come to start referring it to it as a family of related models that share a number of components. I'm really going to focus today just on the climate version of access, or the climate versions of access, um, those that are used on that time scale. It fits with obviously my work area, but also um, the theme of this um, winter school. And I thought um, maybe a way to approach this this lecture was, well, what are the frequently asked questions about access? What are the things that might be going through your mind? Um, I've made a bit of a list. What is access? Who uses it? Why are there so many versions of access and which one should I use? Um, where is access run? How long does a run take? What compute resources does it need? What are the sorts of things we're using access for at the moment? Uh, what do you do if you find a bug in access? Why do you run an experiment more than once? what access model output is available for community use. Hopefully I'll touch on all of those as I give my talk. Hopefully I'll also leave some time for more questions at the end. So if you've got a frequently asked question that you think I've missed off this list, start to think about that now and we can hopefully pick them up at the end. So in the broadest sense, um, access is a national effort beginning around 2005. In its various configurations, it covers all timescales from weather through to climate. It uses um, some local components, some imported components. The vast majority of it is written in Fortran. As Katrin said, lots of this code is really old, as it is in, in most um, large modeling systems such as this. The main people involved in um, this sort of partnership on the Australian side is CSRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Universities and um, with you know, essential support from NCI, the National Computing Infrastructure, um, in order to actually be able to run it. Some of the climate modelling with access is supported through the NESP Earth System and Climate Change Hub. And we are doing a bit of um, a scoping study for ENCRIS at the moment around whether access can be seen as national infrastructure and whether therefore some support through sort of software engineering and stuff um, could come into access in future. As I said, it has a number of imported components. So um, that brings in a number of international partners. So through um, the, the atmosphere component, we're in a partnership with the Met Office and a number of other organizations who are also using the atmospheric model. Um, the ocean we take from uh, GFDL, the ice, uh, sea ice from uh, Los Alamos, and then we've got our university partners down the bottom who um, are also involved in different parts of the model. So I'm going to go through each of the components. Um, so in broad terms, atmosphere, ocean sea ice and ocean carbon, atmospheric chemistry, or the, and land and land carbon. Um, and then we'll see how they all kind of fit together. So our atmospheric component, as I mentioned, is the UK Met Office unified model. Um, over, you know, or in, in current use, we've got a variety of code versions that we are using. So the um, Earth System model I'll talk about in a little while uses the older version 7.3. Some chemistry work uses um, version 8.4. And our most recent coupled model version is at 10.6. But in a sense, the actual code version is less of an issue than um, what you would call was the atmospheric configuration. So we have... Um, our earlier access would use um, what they call the HADGEM2 R1.1 atmospheric configuration. So that's kind of got very traceable to the Met Office. We've got a version which is approximately like the Met Office's GA1. And our current stuff follows, again, the Met Office GA7.1. So there are papers out there, particularly around GA7.1, which documents that configuration <coughs> of the model. Which bits of it are you switching on and off? to run the atmosphere in, in this configuration. We run at a range of resolutions, but principally at what's sort of labeled the N96. It's about um, two degrees by one and a quarter degrees, um, and two different vertical resolutions. Um, our older version, 38 levels, the current at 85 levels. We played around a bit with some of the higher resolutions 
um, but not use them kind of in any long-term or sort of long-term studies. Um, Anna may well have touched on um, some of this yesterday when you heard about the land. Um, so our land component is the Community Atmosphere Biosphere Land Exchange Cable Model, which is our Australian community model. We actually, um, so if, if you um, think about Katrin's um, little bubbles where she showed how different models were coupled together, we do actually put this land model right into the UK Met Office UM atmosphere. So it doesn't done, doesn't done through a coupler, it's embedded in the code. That's um, actually quite a bit of work. Um, and um, not all of our configurations use cables. Sometimes we just do stick with the um, land surface model that comes with the UM. Uh, sort of two parts to cable. There's the part that does the biophysics, so it kind of deals with the canopy, a kind of a big leaf model of a tree which might have sunlit and shaded leaves, deals with the soil, it deals with snow and all of the fluxes that go between the land and the atmosphere. And then we have the biogeochemistry, the, the carbon part of it, and that's really tracking the flow of carbon through from the plants to the litter pools to the soil pools. Each of them kind of have different turnover times and pass carbon from different um, ones I should... so. Yes, plant pools, litter pools, soil pools. Um, we are set up to track nitrogen and phosphorus through those systems as well so that we can look at how um, our ability for the trees to use carbon is impacted by their ability to access nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, different code versions and configurations of cable are used in different access versions depending on the need and that this biogeochemistry, the CASA CMP, is just switched on when we want to do the carbon cycle. Uh, again, you've heard plenty, I think, about the ocean yesterday, so we are using the NOAA GFDL MOM model, a couple of different versions, 4.1 and 5, has a tripolar grid. In our, most of our access work, we're running with the one degree resolution, which has higher resolution at the equator in the southern ocean, 50 levels. We've done um, a bit of work at um, the quarter degree version. Doesn't take a whole lot longer to run, in the one degree version but you have to give it a lot more cores um, so it does have a, a larger compute cost that way and as you pr probably heard the access om2 the offline version um, they've got quarter degree and, and tenth of a degree version set up of that and we have worked quite hard this year to try and make sure we have harmonized the code across um, the access version um, and the offline version and the university users and the CSRO users of the code. So um, that's probably pretty clean at the moment. In terms of biogeochemistry, we have a model called the World Ocean Model of Biogeochemistry and Trophic Dynamics, otherwise known as Wombat. Uh, what the Wombat's got to do with the ocean, I'm not quite sure. Um, it, it does um, account for some of the um, sort of... Uh, I guess the bio part of the system. So looking at um, nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton and detritus, so a so-called NPZD model. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like fairly simple. One category, as I understand it, of phytoplankton, one category of zooplankton. Our sea ice component is taken from the Los Alamos National Lab SICE model. So again, a couple of different... Um, versions of that 4.1 or 5.1.2. It's dealing with modeling those things like sea ice area and thickness. It handles both the dynamics and the thermodynamics of ice. One of the differences between um, these two versions is we were, um, the older version was just configured to use a single ice layer. This has a multiple ice layer and, you know, you get a much, you know, then a, a more smoother, more detailed profile of temperature through the ice um, than you would get with a, a single layer. Um, aerosols and chemistry, again, em embedded into the atmosphere part of this model. Um, so many Earth system processes occur through their aerosol and chemistry interactions and connect connections. A couple of different aerosol schemes. So our, our older configurations use so-called classic um, the newer ones use a GLOMAP mode aerosol scheme. 
um, so it allows you to kind of look at more different size classes, I think. Uh, we have a full chemistry scheme available, so doing both tropospheric and stratospheric chemistry, so allowing to do stuff like the ozone hole. So this, um, as I say, is embedded in the atmosphere model, and it comes from the UK as well. So it's a UK CA chemistry and aerosol scheme. Um, so it impacts on the radiation through um, and via the clouds. Most of um, the inputs to this scheme you have to provide as a kind of um, offline file, though there's the ability for some to be calculated um, <coughs> interactively. A uh, person who provided this slide for me, Matt, said the greatest challenge is the computational cost. So pretty much for all of these chemical species, you have to model their transport through the atmosphere, um, and that, that's a big overhead. We do also have the ability to nudge that model to reanalysis, and the advantage of that is that you can do the chemistry constrained to the kind of the meteorology and for example, um, those of you who've heard about the, um, our monitoring site at Cape Grim where we measure greenhouse gases, you can imagine the time series of CO2 at Cape Grim goes from very clean baseline air that's come over the ocean to a very uh, polluted air that's come across continental Australia, maybe across Melbourne. If you want to compare on that sort of hour by hour time scale out of a model, you need to actually make sure you've kind of nudged it to real meteorology so that you get those shifts in, in the wind from continental to oceanic and such like. Um, you've heard a bit about the component models. Um, Katrin touched this morning on how they can be coupled together in different ways. So if you can think back to her sort of bubble plots, you're probably looking at something for access which is a cross between the GFDL one and the HEDGEM one. And that's you know, perfectly understandable because we've taken the atmosphere from the UK and we've taken the ocean from GFDL and we've kind of got the hybrid in between. So our land and chemistry is embedded directly in the atmosphere. Our ocean is coupled to the atmosphere via the sea ice. Um, so the, the illustration that's been put together here is we have these routines, I to A, ice to atmosphere, I to O, ice to ocean, and vice versa. They go through a coupler, the OASIS MCT coupler. That covers the things like data regridding and passing of the variables. It means that the um, coupling frequency can be different. So from atmosphere to ice happens every three hours from the ice to ocean happens every hour, the same time step as the ocean. Actually quite a lot of fields that you have to pass between the ocean and the atmosphere. So depending on our um, model version, anything between about 70 to 110 2D fields are getting passed um, either way. Um, and the other thing to think about when you're doing the compute resources is that different parts of this model are going to run at different speeds, so you might want to allocate um, differently to each component. So, for example, our atmosphere takes the bulk of our cores, anything between 200 or you know, 768 there for the high-resolution high version. The sea ice only needs 12, the ocean model 84. So very different um, computational cost. The atmosphere is, is taking the, the bulk of it. So yes, putting together a coupled system is not trivial, I think is the main message to take home from that. We also talked a bit too about um, models taking a while to spin up, getting them to equilibrium. So if you're running atmosphere only, you probably only need a few years because it's really just the deep soil layers that are going to slow you down. If you've got a coupled model with an ocean, many hundreds of years, um, particularly for the deep ocean, so um, that top right-hand plot is temperature. And you can see it's, it's kind of started up here, probably initialized to some kind of present-day conditions. It has a really fast coupling shock. And then a very you know, slow recovery after that. And even after this is kind of almost out to 900 years, we've still got a bit of a, a drift in temperature. And again, it's going to be this challenge between 
how much compute resource do I have? How long can I afford to run this spin-up period before I actually really need to get into doing some experiments with it? And, and you can see here we've got some fairly, you know, periods when the model doesn't seem to be drifting much at all. And you go, oh, great, let's start our PI control run here. And then, you know, in the next hundred years, it kind of suddenly jumps up again. And you kind of, oh, maybe we should wait. And in fact, you know, because we've been changing other things in the model, we're actually not going to start our runs um, or haven't started our runs up to about year 950. The carbon cycle, again, takes a long while to equilibrate. Um, soil carbon, ocean carbon, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, this shows in blue the ocean carbon. For the carbon cycle in sort of equilibrium, you want to get down to zero is what you're aiming for here. Um, our land is pretty much there. Our ocean, we were kind of, in this configuration, had a bit of a, an offset of, you know, maybe 0.1 of a pedogram, which was just, you know, take forever to get down to zero. So these are the things that you either need to, you know, potentially need to correct for in your experiment or at least be aware of. Um, and then, you know, if you want to take a, um, you know, start doing couple model runs with access, well, then you wouldn't start from here. You'd get a restart file from someone else and, it, you know, assume that you were nicely spun up to start with depending on your application. Uh, so access model versions just for climate time scales, as I said, um, you know, access is run for NWP, it's run seasonal, decadal with different sort of component configurations. But just in terms of the climate stuff I've got on the left hand box, this is our kind of physical model. These ones are our carbon and chemistry models. When I say earth system model, I have a much more limited view of the world than Katrin does, and really it just means we've got the carbon cycle switched on. But going to the physical model first, Access 1.0 and Access 1.3, um, these were our model versions that were used for CMIT 5. They're documented in a paper in AMOG. AMOG is now JSHESH. And the, the main difference between these two model versions was that they differed in their land surface scheme, so one used the UK Met Office scheme, one used cable, and in some of their atmospheric settings, particularly around the cloud scheme. Access 1.4 was just really um, a minor update from Access 1.3. It did change the coupler, which was to a much more efficient one, had some minor fixes. It's um, documented in Appendix A of um, my paper, which is actually around the Earth system model, but because Access 1.4 was the physical model that we used. That's how it ended up in that paper. And Access CM2 is our current physical model that we're working on, has many model component upgrades relative to Access 1.3. It's a new configuration. It's the one we're using for CMIP 6, and it um, has a documentation paper in preparation. Um, look out for it um, in the next six months, let's say. So Access ESM1, basically Access 1.4 plus the carbon cycle, um, documented in this paper. Nightmare process to get this through GMD. Reckon it took us two years. Um, we ran some CMIT5 experiments with this model, but we didn't ever actually submit them. Um, we were kind of a bit too late to have sort of impact in the, the multi-model analysis, so we didn't um, go through the the overhead of actually doing the submission. From Access ESM1, we've made a ESM 1.5. We learnt some stuff through doing it the first time that, they, that we wanted to fix, so there's been some code and parameter fixes. We didn't have land use change in our first version. We needed at least a simple land use change scheme. We've put that in. It's being used for CMIP 6, and a paper's being put together by Tilo Zine, again for JSHESH. Um, as a bit of a separate um, effort, we do have a chemistry version of Access CM2, um, mostly at the moment being run atmosphere only, but could be run um, coupled. I think I've probably got one or two examples, maybe only one later on that shows some results from that. So a little bit about compute resources. So um, we run this on the National Computational Infrastructure, the machine called Ragen. 
depending on the um, resolution of the atmosphere, we're using something between 300 and 900 cores. Um, the cheaper version take, uh, costs one kilo service unit per model year. If you've used RAGEN, you'll kind of maybe understand what those numbers mean. The um, more expensive version is five. Our CM2 model is running at about four to five model years per day. And this figure on the right shows kind of throughput between, you know, what's that, 27th of May across for about the last month. You can see it is quite variable. Um, these are three different runs. Um, typically, most runs, when they're active, they're going at roughly the same speed. You can get periods for, you know, no apparent reason where it just sits in the queue for a long while and you lose your throughput. Um, we're kind of getting to the end of the quarter. I don't know if that means some users have sort of dropped off the system because they've run out of time. So we're getting a, some more consistent throughput at the moment. Um, the ESM 1.5 is a bit faster to run because it has this lower vertical resolution in the atmosphere. Uh, so seven to eight model years per day. It does mean that you're looking at about two to three weeks for 100 model years. And of course, it produces a lot of um, model output and you've got to learn, you know, work out where you're going to store that. So now I probably want to take you through um, some examples of some different types of model simulations that we use Access for. And they do, um, in these examples, parallel quite a lot the sorts of model runs that are done for CMIP. And um, Julie's going to take you through CMIP in more detail tomorrow. Um, so, that, you know, let's just step through these. The control runs might be run under pre-industrial or present-day forcing, and it's, the forcing is kept constant through the run. Climate sensitivity experiments, so you're trying to understand how your model responds to an idealized change in forcing, so maybe 1% increasing CO2 or a doubling or quadrupling of CO2. Historical simulations, typically we're studying those around 1850, coming up to close to present day. So for CMIP 5, they went to 2005. For CMIP 6, they're going through to 2014. And um, mostly fully coupled, but in that sort of category of historical simulations, there are the atmosphere-only ones. Um, these predated doing a decoupled run, run, so they had, prior to CMIP, there was AMIP, the Atmospheric Model Intercomparison Project. And so atmosphere-only runs tend to kind of acquire that AMIP acronym. Typically, 1979 to the present, and as I said, some of our chemistry runs, we're doing atmosphere only as well. Um, looking beyond the, the historical, the climate projections, out to 2100 typically, but you can go beyond that, um, depending on your forcing. And then a, a category I would class as the sort of what-if experiments. What if I change the climate system in this way? How would the rest of the system respond? What if I could suddenly suck CO2 out of the atmosphere? And um, that's kind of the case that I'm going to show for that example. The other thing I really just wanted to note too is that almost all the CMIP experiments assume a um, prescribed greenhouse gas forcing. So they're concentration driven. So even if you're running a full ESM or an, a, a climate model with a carbon cycle, you might diagnose your land and ocean fluxes, but you're not actually letting those fluxes influence the atmosphere. That's a different type of run. I've characterized it here as emissions driven. So in that case, you take the history of CO2 emissions, anthropogenic emissions into the atmosphere over the historical period, and then your land and ocean carbon as they respond those fluxes would be put into the atmosphere or taken out of the atmosphere, and you get a truly interactive CO2. Most of the CMIP runs aren't run in that way, so it does mean, say, for example, as you go forward in time through the scenarios, if your really warm world stopped taking up carbon or, or the, you know, the land, ocean or whatever, um, you're not kind of going to see that directly in your atmospheric CO2 concentration. You'd get it through a sort of implied emissions, you know, what would the anthropogenic emissions have to be in order to balance out these land and carbon 
ocean carbon fluxes. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Anyway, jumping through these categories, control simulations. So typically used to assess the model drift, to understand the natural variability of the model, and to test sensitivity to different model configurations. So a couple of examples here, global surface air temperature through the 500 years of the control simulation of access 1.0 and 1.3. And you can see that in this case, 1.0 was drifting a little bit. Um, it's sort of, what, 0.4 degrees over 500 years, um, less drift in the access 1.3 model. And that's just important to understand because, you know, any of your simulations of the historical and the future need to kind of be accounting for that underlying background trend or drift that you've got in the model. This is an ocean example from um, the ESM 1.5 model. It's the passage or the um, water passage through the Drake Passage, so between Antarctica and South America. Um, and you can see that in our control run, we're, we're really stable, um, but we have some really interesting multi-decadal variability um, in that variable. Um, here's another example that I wanted to show because um, sometimes you change one part of the climate system without really thinking about how it might impact on a different part of the climate system. So this was um, in our Earth system modelling work. We had two ways of running the model. We could run it where we had a prescribed leaf area index. So it just took the vegetation, prescribed a leaf area index, and that would then you know, impact on roughness and albedo and stuff like that. In the other case, we let our carbon pools grow, our leaf carbon pool grow, and our leaf area index then became dependent on that leaf carbon pool. So it was a prognostic leaf area index. And what we found here, this is a plot of zonal mean LAI. This is the northern hemisphere. The prescribed value is this black dashed line. Every vegetation type, but particularly the evergreen needle leaf vegetation, overestimated the leaf area index. This then led to a temperature difference, which was predominantly in this sort of northern high latitudes, which then led to quite a dramatic decrease in um, April sea ice thickness. So this is our prescribed leaf air index, and this was a, a sea ice thickness that we were pretty happy with. When we went to a prognostic leaf area index, you can see um, how much thinner the sea ice there is. And I have to say, because I kind of work with the Earth system model and I'm kind of an atmospheric carbon person, that it hadn't even really occurred to me to go and actually look at what the, the sea ice was doing, and it took one of our sea ice modelers to go and go, oh, I don't know whether you really want this result. Um, and it's something that we have endeavoured to fix um, in our um, later version or our current version of the ESM to actually reduce these leaf area indexes that had got too high and were having this warming impact. <coughs> Again, an example about um, using the control run to test different configurations or different parameter sets in a model. So this is um, ocean um, carbon uh, related variables, so the primary production from the ocean surface, phos surface phosphate, which is one of the nutrients. On the right here, you've got the observations. This was our ESM1 simulation, so you know, clearly really high surface um, phosphate um, and some um, production primary production, very centred on the tropics, nothing away from the tropics and some really hot spots. Um, and our ESM 1.5 with some um, better parameter set or retuned parameters um, looked, looked better overall. I mean, one of the things that you're always challenged with once you start to add, um, you're adding carbon into a, a coupled model is that um, you might sort of tune your ocean carbon based on a sort of observed ocean, but your coupled model ocean is never going to perfectly represent your observed ocean. So, you know, then you're kind of left with, well, I've got errors in the ocean carbon because I have errors in my ocean physical model. Do I kind of trade these off or do I kind of live with a poor ocean carbon simulation because I've still got problems with my physical model? 
Moving on to the climate sensitivity style of run. So these are typically some fairly idealized experiments. This is the one where you um, immediately um, shift your um, atmospheric concentration of CO2 to four times its, its pre-industrial value. And um, what you see here, um, there's multiple simulations on here. These are the control ones going down the bottom. The red one is the one that um, is our current or close to current um, access CM2 version. So you get a very rapid rise in temperature, which then starts to sort of um, slow down its increase as you go on in time. These are typically run out to about 150 years, so we haven't quite got there yet. Um, you have a change in the top of atmosphere net flux, so a very large perturbation to start off with, which then starts to sort of decay away. Um, there's a kind of um, methodology prescribed within the um, climate modelling community for sort of CMIP and stuff to estimate the so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity from this type of run. The paper describing the method is here. You're basically doing a regression between the change in radiative flux, so that right-hand plot on the other side, with the change in surface air temperature, the left-hand plot on the last slide, and your equilibrium climate sensitivity is where it intersects with the zero radiative flux here. This is from a four times CO2 run. People tend to quote their ECS for two times CO2, so you just halve this intercept here. For the ESM 1.5, um, across the full 150 years, we've got a 3.9. That was probably sort of mid to upper of the CMIP-5 range. For CM2, at the, at the point where we did this calculation, we only had 90 years of the run. We estimate that if you'd had the 450 years, it would change its slope, flatten it a bit. So you'd get well, something around the 5 to 5.1. This would have been pretty much off scale for CMIP-5. Got us a bit worried. The latest... Um, indication from CMIP-6 is that a whole number of models um, are actually shifted to higher climate sensitivity. And I don't know whether Julie will touch on this tomorrow. There was a bit of a um, sort of news item in science about it um, a couple of months ago. Um, but yes, people have changed typically the complexity of their atmospheres in a variety of ways and many of the big centres, the the Met Office, NCAR, um, are, are coming up with a higher climate sensitivity number, which is really kind of um, an interesting place to be as we come into the um, IPCC next assessment report and actually, um, you know, going through that process of explaining why the models are, are different from the last round and what implications that might have um, for the, the international assessments. Um, this is another typical climate sensitivity run. It's the 1% CO2, so a more gradual increase in CO2. It's used for just assessing um, temperature, um, but it's also used in a carbon context for understanding feedbacks between the climate and the carbon cycle. And so you get cases where you might run the 1% CO2 increasing, which is seen by both the carbon cycle and by the radiation scheme or cases where it's only seen by the radiation scheme or only seen by the biogeochemistry. So for the temperature, the one where you, the radiation scheme sees it increases at almost the same rate as the full system, whereas if the biogeochemistry is seeing the increasing CO2 but not the radiation scheme, then you're pretty much down where the control run is. It, it's kind of fairly linear in temperature. For land carbon uptake, um, in our latest runs, it's not looking that way. So what you see is the, the green case, the biogeochemistry sees the increasing CO2, but the, temp you know, the temperature is not warming. You tend to get a little bit more land carbon uptake than the full case, but not a whole lot more. If you warm the world without increasing CO2, then you're actually losing carbon um, from the land system. 
and quite substantially in our model version. And typically, um, these sorts of calculations vary quite a lot across different ESMs. It's probably one of the more uncertain parts of the, the um, chemistry car uh, carbon climate feedback um, work. Uh, moving on to some historical simulations. So um, these are typically used for model assessment compared to present day observations when you're into the later part of the run um, and also the sensitivity of the model to historical forcings. So for example, bottom left here, we have the temperature um, anomaly for cases where you just have greenhouse gases changing. Uh, the red, all forcings, so greenhouse gas and aerosols. The green, the natural forcings. And you can see that um, certainly in the access model, as in the UK Met Office, we have quite a strong aerosol cooling. Um, if you're running with greenhouse gases alone, you'd be a whole lot warmer. In fact, our, this, where this red lies a little bit below the black dash line, this is probably where the aerosols are doing too much cooling. Um, also here you see um, the major volcanoes have been marked. Um, we know that that's going to have a, a temperature impact on the system. This is another carbon example where we were looking at the land carbon uptake with and without anthropogenic aerosols. So if you run without anthropogenic aerosols where you've got a much warmer world, we got much less carbon uptake compared to a case where we had both forcing switched on. And that kind of fit with the, the green line here is a kind of estimate um, from the Global Carbon Project. Um, so that's kind of where you want your model to be close to. Uh, these were some of the sort of assessment um, of present day climate used in the IPCC. Um, so the plot on the left is actually from the um, AR5 assessment report. It was using, um, so this is different metrics down this column, uh, this different rows. Each column is a different model. The far left hand one is the multi-model mean. Uh, blue is better, red is worse. So you can see that the multi-model mean comes out best of all. Um, you're kind of, you know, averaging out the noise, keeping the signal is hopefully the, the case. Uh, the two access models were here on the left and um, we were pretty happy with how they performed across the um, multi-model ensemble. Um, and this is just a, a different kind of measure. It's a skill score for Australia, which combined different variables, temperature, pressure, and precip. Um, again, these two red bars um, are the two access models. Um, a larger number is better. So, of course, you know, that's the reason why this plot is in here, because it showed access 1.0 being the best out of these 25 models. Um, this one, Mark 3.6, is kind of the um, high resolution version of your Mark 3L that you're playing with this week. And, um, you know, this is also a nice story for kind of why we moved to Access and left behind our Mark III version. Um, I said I had one plot with some chemistry in, so this is an AMIT run with chemistry, so it's from late 1980s through to um, 2008 or 10. Um, it's showing the total mean, zonal mean, total column ozone, so south to north, and these blue spots here are an ozone hole, so yes, it manages roots and ozone hole and it has some intranual variability. Um, I don't think the analysis has really got as far to check whether the intranual variability seen here is realistic or not. Uh, fourth category of run was our climate projections, so taking us from the present day out into the future. Um, these were our access 1.0 and 1.3 results for our mid-case scenario and our high-level scenario. So 4.5 and 8.5, so a temperature increase of something over 2 degrees to something over 4 degrees. This plot on the right is showing you a spatial map of the last decade of the century versus um, pre-industrial, so not versus present day, under the lowest scenario that was run for CMIP 5, the RCP 2.6. And I guess the... Um, the point here was just that 
You know, we talk in the Paris Climate Agreement about staying under two degrees, staying under one and a half degrees globally, but we do have to remember that within that global number, there's a whole lot of spatial variability and, you know, we know that the poles are likely or expected to warm more than um, other latitudes. Um, and so this scale, if you can't read it, is going up to five, seven, nine degrees here. And this is my example of a what-if experiment, but it you know, covers those sorts of things like geoengineering, the stuff that we can't actually do with the planet, but we'd like to know how the planet might respond. Um, so solar radiation management are the sort of ideas about maybe putting extra aerosols into the stratosphere, um, mimicking a sort of volcano. Um, carbon dioxide removal, you know, there's various methods that people are talking about, but, you know, the carbon capture and storage, things like that. So here's just an idealised experiment to say, well, how reversible is the system? If we ramp up CO2, this black line, at 1% CO2, and then 140 years in the future, we magically manage to decrease it in um, the opposite manner, then you keep it constant, how's um, the planet going to respond? So um, as we'd expect, the temperature goes up, Temperature comes down, but more slowly than it went up. Actually stays above the pre-industrial level for, in fact, hundreds of years after you get back to the pre-industrial CO2. And um, how does the, the... These were done with prescribed CO2, so not an interactive thing, but how does the land and ocean carbon respond? So the blue is the ocean. So as CO2 starts to go up, you take... Um, carbon out of the atmosphere and into the ocean. As soon as you change the direction of that signal, um, that process reverses and you start to release carbon back into the atmosphere um, until you get to, back to pre-industrial and then you've kind of got a slow recovery back to an equilibrium value. The land carbon um, initially takes up carbon. As it then gets too warm, um, it starts to release back to the atmosphere even before you've reached maximum CO2, stays as a sort of source and then gradually um, returns to um, zero, at least in our model version of this. We are participating in the coupled model intercomparison project phase six with access. There's about 100 registered model versions um, for this phase. Only five of them are led from the Southern Hemisphere and two of those are going to be the access ones. There's a whole range of experiments, um, part of CIMIT-6, so there's the core stuff. Some of these experiments I've just shown you, the AMIP, the control, the 1% CO2, the four times CO2, and the historical. If you've got a full ESM, you do an interactive version as well, so an ESM PI control with interactive CO2 and an ESM historical with anthropogenic emissions. There are 21 affiliated MIPS, including Scenario MIPS. Scenario MIPS, the one that does the forward projections. PMIP is, would be one of those affiliated MIPS. Um, it's not on our list of stuff that we would sort of drive out of CSRO, but you know, if other people are wanting to participate in PMIP, you know, we're certainly happy to collaborate on that. So the ones that we will commit to to be involved with is obviously the core stuff, scenario MIP. On the CM2 model, it'll be probably OMIP, FAF MIP, and the radiative forcing MIP. On the ESM 1.5, our two of most interest are the C4 MIP, which is coupled climate carbon cycle, and CDR MIP, the carbon dioxide removal. So what's the status of our CMIP6 runs? Um, we're a bit further ahead with ESM 1.5 than we are with CM2. Um, so this was just a kind of summary. It's the temperature change. So got the four times CO2, this reversibility experiment, the 1% CO2, PI controls, some historical runs, and some other um, CDR lit runs here. Our historical runs, it's looking like um, we probably had a bug in the land use change module. We don't think it'll affect the climate, but we'll probably end up rerunning these anyway. The CM2, um, the initial focus was on the control, the historical, and the four times CO2. We got to this point in the run, 
found a bug. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's as far as we got before we stopped those runs. Where we're at as of yesterday morning, um, four times CO2 is running but not shown. This is the global mean surface temperature with the control run. So we started here, it's actually I think year 950 in the control, um, in the, after 950 years of spin up, we're starting the control run. The orange is the historical. We've got a nice strong Krakatoa volcano signal in here, um, which has then a corresponding positive anomaly in the March sea ice in the northern hemisphere doesn't have a lot of impact in the southern hemisphere. So those runs are ticking along, hopefully as we speak. Okay, this is taking me longer than I'd expected. I really just wanted to talk about finding bugs because bugs are inevitable in this, the code of this size and, and it's really important that we kind of face up to that and we need to assess their significance. So this is um, the bug that stopped our CMIP6 runs with CM2. And um, there's two runs here. This was what led us to find this. There's a, an AMIP run which is using um, a version of Access that still had the UK Met Office land scheme in. And on the right, um, the version with cable. And I mean, spot the difference, I guess, is the question here. What do you see that's different between those two plots? There's a difference in the kind of the mean background value. Um, this is basically sea salt aerosol optical depth. Much harder to spot is there's actually some middle values off the coast of um, South America here, which are really, really high. And here's it more obviously, where we have, instead of looking at a mean value, if we look at the maximum value over these years of the run, this is a, you know, acceptable simulation with a maximum of 0.14. This is our unacceptable simulation with a maximum of 42. This maximum or this uh, maximum monthly value or the, the sea salt turns out is dependent on the 10 meter wind speed, which is kind of a diagnostic variable in the model. So it's not actually used in the kind of the main model simulation and our actual wind speeds on model levels were fine it just turned out that it was our 10 meter wind speed, which was not fine. So this is the not fine case on this side, where um, although this scale only goes up to 100, it had a maximum of 1,589 meters per second over South America. Then of course you go like, oh no, have we got this problem in the ESM model as well that we never even noticed? Fortunately, for some reason, the maximum 10 meter wind speed is a output required for CMIP. So we actually have this field here. Oh, it only goes up to 50. Phew, that one's okay. So, um, so this, this was, um, you know, one of these bad points. Okay, wind speed goes off scale. Actually doesn't affect the sensible or latent heat flux. So that big spike not showing up here. Little bit of, of a spike in um, one of the momentum fluxes, but certainly not off scale in the same that the wind speed was. So our conclusion was that, you know, we, we certainly had unphysical spikes in the cable diagnostic 10 meter wind speed occurred in calm stable conditions. The surface fluxes were unaffected, so we don't actually expect to have much impact on the overall climate. But several of the important CMIT-6 diagnostics did show the effect. They were fields that we would be expected to submit to CMIT-6. They were ones that we wouldn't want to submit with this problem. So we did decide to stop the runs and restart them. In the process of doing this, we did notice some other um, bugs related to um, the UKCA interaction with jewels and cable, the land surface scheme. So, you know, we did three bugs for the price of one and restarted the model, but we did lose about eight weeks of, of runtime. Just a quick word on ensembles. Um, ensembles are important to help us to distinguish between what's natural variability, what's um, for, you know, a signal forced by the forcing. Um, the smaller the signal you're looking at, the smaller the area, the larger the ensemble you'd probably 
want to look at. These are some AMIT runs, um, mostly running, so there was an ensemble of three runs using the UK Met Office land scheme, Jules, and at this point only one ensemble member which had cable in. This is for Australian rainfall. Um, so you can see here you get things like this year where all three ensemble members and the different model all gave a high value compared to the observations. Got another case here where the cable-based one is low, but all three Jules ensemble members are high. And then you get other ones where even though you know, there's some variation amongst the ensemble, the cable will then sit within that ensemble. So, you know, these are kind of just giving you some pointers as to where might I then want to dig into the model to actually try and understand, you know, why is this year so much wetter than it should be? Why, in this case, does Jules apparently do one thing, cable do another? Or, you know, once we've got an ensemble of at least three cable runs, maybe they'll be closer together, less spread. This one was actually, um, Joe mentioned the impact of volcanoes. Um, and I was looking at the land carbon sensitivity to volcanoes, but in terms of an ensemble result here, too, it's showing how, depending on the background state of your system, the volcano can have more or less impact in terms of its land temperature anomaly. So Krakatoa from 1880-something, you know, in one run had only a temperature anomaly of 0.2, minus 0.2 of a degree, down here is about minus 0.6 of a degree. I mean, the nice thing was then that the land carbon response to that temperature change was fairly consistent across those different cases. But um, again, a, a, a case where you probably do need to run an ensemble if you're trying to diagnose the, the impact of, say, a volcano. Uh, availability of access model output. So access 1.0 and 1.3, the CMIT5 runs are obviously available through the large CMIT5 data set on the Earth System Federation grid and, and our results are at, um, certainly sitting at NCI. The ESM1 results, um, I've given you a link here to a catalogue which tells you what runs we did and what's available. We did have to move those all from NCI onto a CR CSRO machine to make way for our CMIT6 run. So if you want those and you're not based at CSRO, you'll need to get in contact with us to see what we can arrange. The Access CM2 and Access ESM 1.5, we will try and make them available as um, soon as we've kind of got them together ourselves. And there is quite a bit of information out on the web um, about Access its different configurations, its set up, some fairly technical information on this wiki. It's not necessarily very well organised, so you might have to dig a bit to find what you want, but it's probably worth having a, a little look at if you're going to be an access user in future. Which brings me back to my list of questions. I hope I've covered most of those. I haven't, in fact, left you lots of time to add to that list, but if there is anything that does come to mind that you want to know, I'm certainly happy to answer questions now or over lunch. to do the four tier one um, runs. I think from um, an ESM perspective, we're probably interested in the lowest one. Um, we, we got to the point with the ESM model that we had our first trial of our highest SSP, they're called SSPs now, not RCPs, um, running and that was when we found our problem with the, the land use scheme. So they're kind of a bit on pause at the moment. Um, but certainly in this next quarter is when we will be aiming to get those run. Um, so somewhere between July and September. Um, and yes, tier one will be our first focus and then we'll see how we go. But they're actually not that big a cost, only about 80, you know, whatever it is, 85 years compared to doing historical runs. 
but again, it's the sort of the trade-off between would we rather have a larger ensemble with a small number of scenarios or do more of the scenarios. So with the volcanoes, yeah. yeah so um, basically, we it's like you know you change the aerosol um, in the stratosphere, and then that impacts through the yeah, climate exactly. system. So how do you actually like, in Canada? We have the volcanic conditions, so we keep the all roads like the and all that. This would be one peak event, so it could be at a specific location, but you would have to spread your stuff like that. Like you have, how do you decide to that? Alright, so, so it, will, it will be dependent on the model. For our access model, at least for our older model, it was really just um, for the, the stratospheric aerosols, we have four bands, so pretty much a high latitude, tropical, southern, tropical, north, um, you know. So, yes, so it's four bands, and then depending on the size of the volcano, would be a perturbation to the aerosols in that band. So you'd kind of get, on a sort of zonal mean, some geographical information. So some volcanoes, in the tropics, it, the aerosol tends to spread anyway, so you get a pretty global signal. If you've got a, a high latitude volcano, it might only be seen in the, in the forcing at that latitude. Now, of course, going into the future, we can't predict when a volcano is going to blow. So for both the PI control and for the future, you try and just put in a sort of background volcanic aerosol level that's kind of going to be comparable with the historical run so that you don't kind of have a step change going from control to historical to future. And apart from the organic, there is like such a kind of uh, something that you can Um, so, so we do um, think we do carry some var the variations in the solar forcing. So, so the the um, solar input, yeah. So we've got some variations in that. Um, I mean, there's there are other the other forcing fields, and yeah. So there's obviously the the greenhouse gases. I mean, we do the aerosols, so sulfate aerosol, the anthropogenic forcing from that. Ozone, we would mostly prescribe unless you were running the chemistry model and then you got obviously interactive ozone. Um, so, yeah, so again, it comes down to complexity. You know, this point that Katrin's making, you need a model that's going to have the complexity you need for the problem that you're going to solve. And, to, and then whether you want something interactive, which obviously adds to the complexity of your system but also maybe adds to the uncertainty of the system. In some cases, doing a prescribed field might be better. So, for example, we don't actually do dynamic vegetation at the moment. You know, in, in, in terms of kind of what's the larger forcing to the system, on the timescales that we're dealing with, present day to 2100, maybe it's kind of the anthropogenic land use and choices that humans are making about how the land surface is used that may be more of more impact than the natural dynamics in the system. So we've kind of focused on kind of trying to get at least some simple land use change in our model rather than the, the dynamic vegetation. But I mean, again, you know, it comes down to, you know, if you're building an earth system model, ultimately, unless you're doing paleo work, you probably need the human influence as well. You know, do you need that kind of socioeconomic model that also interacts with the system to define how your land is used, how your CO2 emissions are growing, things like that. So, yes, we can build even more complex models if we want. <laughs>